Um, Marissa, I truly appreciate the um, very nice introduction and Dr. Moreno uh, is, is with me. I will very briefly um, do a little supplement to my introduction, uh, allow him to introduce himself and then we'll kind of dive right into our uh, experiences with correctional health and the interface with um, behavioral health and psychiatry. So my name is Dr. Chad Zaywitz. As mentioned, I'm an infectious disease uh, specialist. I'm also board certified in internal medicine, and I have been working at the Cook County Jail in Chicago since, well, since I graduated from my fellowship back in 2004. It's a, a long, um, not particularly interesting story of how I ended up there. We'll just say it was more serendipity than an initial uh, directed career choice to work in correctional health. But once I found myself in that environment, uh, it just, as weird as it might sound to say this, um, it was a match made in heaven for me as a, as a, as a career direction that I never saw coming. We, uh, you know, we are a subset of Cook County Health, and we serve the same community that our safety net organization, which is the Cook County Health um, system here in, in our county locally. And I, I don't know there are folks on from other regions besides the Chicago area. That being said, um, it's mission driven, meaning we serve the underserved, we serve the disenfranchised, um, sometimes the, the, the folks who have been forgotten, had people turn their backs to them. And quite frankly, there I can't think of many populations that are more highly stigmatized than folks who are in custody, th that alone let alone layer in the um, additional uh, challenges such as behavioral health issues and um, substance abuse addiction. This is what we do. And I don't, I never saw myself working in, in this environment, but I, once I got there, I just kind of got hooked. So that's, that's the, the quick and dirty of uh, what I do. I'm, I, I do infectious diseases, but we have a lot of interface with behavioral health issues and our behavioral health department. Um, and I've worked with Dr. Moreno at the jail for um, quite a few years. So I'll pass the baton to him for an introduction. Thank you, Chad. Uh, well, as uh, previously noted, my name is Dr. Michael Moreno. Um, I worked full time at the Cook County Correctional Facility from uh, 2010 to 2004. And then I stayed on uh, part time until 2007 or 2017. I'm sorry, we're moving up a decade. I'm aging myself. Um, uh, again, as Chad said, my uh, kind of foray into correctional psychiatry was not one that I anticipated. I, um, anyone who's from the Chicagoland area, I had uh, aspirational goals to be a psychoanalyst and have a fantastic office on Michigan Avenue overlooking the lake and, you know, all that jazz. Um, the realities of that world are uh, dwindling fast for all psychiatrists. Um, and when it came time to graduate from residency, um, I was looking for a job in the health system. Um, there was nothing available at the time, but they said, well, you know, we got this position over at the jail, which is under our same umbrella. Why don't you see how that goes? Um, sure, why not? Um, and, you know, even to this day, I will say that that is like the best job I ever had. Um, it is extremely interesting. Um, I, you know, I have a voyeuristic curiosity about people who would engage in, you know, behavior that I could never, ever fathom. Um, you know, or, um, you know, the interest of driving into the into work in the morning and listening to the news radio and saying, okay, I'm going to see that person today. I'm going to see that person today. Um, just a really strange kind of thing to sit across from someone who's there for something heinous. And, um, you know, you're there not to judge, you're there to help, um, which we could talk about later as a, a difficulty many people in medicine and psychiatrists as well um, struggle with. Um, uh, I then got the opportunity to uh, leave the jail, my first home, uh, and became chair of emergency psychiatry for Cook County Health, uh, again, within the same umbrella. Um, but I still work closely with uh, the Department of Corrections. Um, as Dr. Zaywitz described, uh, you know, they're getting treatment while they're incarcerated. And part of the program there is to get aftercare. Um, Dr. Zaywitz provides aftercare at the core center. Um, and I provide 
provide continuity of care between those folks who are uninsured on the uh, psychiatric side of the correctional uh, department um, as they return back into um, you know, general society um, to provide ongoing care. So, uh, you know, Dr. Moreno, I was thinking maybe what might help to give the, um, the group on board with us today some context is to, I'm gonna just use my words to try to provide a visual of the jail numbers, size, what it physically looks like to dispel a little bit of, I think, some preconceived ideas of what uh, jail, our jail, and, and what a lot of correctional health actually looks like. And then maybe we'll walk through um, a hypothetical patient from the minute they enter custody and how they would interface with the behavioral health system. So here's the big picture. Uh, and again, I'm speaking to our site, the Cook County Jail, which is arguably one of the largest single site correction facilities anywhere in the United States. We are a big jail. Before the pandemic, we, um, we're, on, we're, we're on 26th in California. Our compound is uh, greater than 90 acres. It's a huge compound. There are 15 separate buildings called divisions. They're living units. So when you picture the jail, the jail is not a building with cells and bars and people behind the bars. It is a, a series of se separated buildings sequestered from each other, connected by a network of tunnels underground. And each building has a purpose. People are secured on the facility based on their security level, minimum, medium, maximum. They're separated by their sex, male or female. They're separated by their medical and their behavioral health needs, whether they have medical issues, uh, psychiatric issues, a combination of both. So each building uh, in and of itself has a specific purpose. Each building or division has a sort of self-contained medical home or dispensary where there are assigned medical and behavioral health providers who work in that one building to provide the population housed within with whatever services they need. And then at the very center of the co compound is the so-called CIRMAC hospital, which for those of you who may have heard of CIRMAC, it is not a hospital. It is the uh, health center hub. It's, a, um, it's, it's technically not even an infirmary. We call it the medical and psychiatric special care unit. Our patients with the highest acuity or highest complexity of need, medical or behavioral health would be housed within that building, but that's really a few dozen of our detainees. The compound at capacity holds up to 8,000 detainees. We presently have about 5,600 on the compound. And again, I mentioned pre-pandemic, our census was higher. There has been some decarceration. And I, if anyone lets me talk long enough, I soapbox and we can go into it a little bit about what happens with, um, with our role in decarceration. And I see, I see, is it Bryson? You're smiling and nodding. <laughs> so I think you, you, you may even be thinking some of this yourself, but, and we, we, we Michael and I really encourage, uh, we're gonna talk for a little while, but we would encourage you to have a, a, an exchange with us. So we're not gonna talk the whole hour. So anyway, back to the building. So that's how the, they're, they're separated is by these, these medical psychiatric security and other divisions. When uh, we'll walk you through a hypothetical incarceration process. Um, I'll explain the, the general gist of how they would engage. And then I'll say, once they meet someone from you know, Michael's department, this is what happens next. All right, so here we go. Someone in the community is arrested and they are, oh, wait, one more big backup, Re reset button. Difference between jail and prison is very important. And I know a lot of people know the answer and a lot of people think they know the answer, but I don't want you to think you know, I want you to know. So here's the difference. Jail means pretrial detainee. It means someone has been charged with a crime and they are being detained, they are in custody until they have their day in court. And then either they are, you know, found innocent or bond out and are released back to the community, which is about two thirds of the folks who are arrested, or they are convicted and they are sentenced to prison. And then prison is where someone goes from becoming a detainee to an inmate. And then they are, they are sent off to the prison system, which is entirely separate from the jail system. 
Prisons and jails are not about short stay versus long stay, which is what I think most people have fashioned in their brain. And when you hear, like this is TV, when they say, I'm going to send you to jail for the rest of your life. When I hear that, I laugh and go, wow, that the criminal justice system in whatever TV show this is, is completely broken because that means they never went to court, which is, of course, unconstitutional. So jail means pretrial, prison means sentenced and convicted. Some people are in jail for much, much longer than they will ever be in prison because the time they are in custody counts towards their sentence. So if it takes four years to adjudicate the case and they're sentenced to six years, they might only do two years or less in prison. So erase the time timeline and just think pretrial, sentenced and convicted. So that's jail versus prison. We are a jail. So we interface with our community. They come in raw and, 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 uh, and, and sometimes very disorganized, um, high, withdrawing from drugs or alcohol, just in a, in, in a pure state of, imagine if you had been arrested, the, the fugue that you would be in mentally and behaviorally. So they get arrested, they are charged with a crime, they are brought to a police lockup somewhere in Cook County. And then if you've ever seen those little white cube shaped paddy wagons driving around the city, they are usually going around to the precincts and collecting the, and I, I forgive any, anyone finds any of my chosen words as offensive or un-PC or whatever, it's not meant to come across that way, but the, the catch of the day, they will scoop them up, put them in the paddy wagons and bring them to our jail. Then they go through processing. So the processing works like this. They get out of the van, they get out of the paddy wagon, the Department of Corrections performs their initial security evaluation, their personal effects are taken and secured and, and, and they're given a jail uniform, they're searched, they go through an x-ray, then they go through Department of Corrections processing where they get their identification, their photo ID, they ask them about gang affiliation, whatever processing Department of Corrections does. And when that's all finished, then every single person who comes into custody immediately gets a medical and a mental health assessment. That's the first stop. They do not go into the jail proper. They are not housed until they have their initial assessment. So I am paraphrasing a much more complex process. Hi, do you have any medical or mental health concerns and what are they? Are you on or are you supposed to be on any medications and what are they? Or do I, the screener, perceive you who is sitting in front of me to have a medical or mental health concern that concerns me enough to wanna to send you to the next step. And if the answer is yes to any of those, they will go for what's called a secondary medical or a secondary mental health evaluation. The medical are done by my colleagues from the medical and we'll do what you know medical people do, diabetes, blood pressure, HIV, you name it. And if they have a behavioral health, they will see some of Dr. Moreno's colleagues. That's, that's the intake process. So. Now, since this is about behavioral health and psychiatry, I wanted to have Dr. Marino shed some light on what happens from intake to the time they get into their ultimate housing area. Right. So um, once they get processed up to where Dr. Zaywitz was talking about in that secondary mental health screening, if at that screening, the licensed professional, usually a social worker, LCSW, LCPC, um, is making an assessment and devising an initial plan. Um, sometimes the patient is just sent to general population with, uh, fall, with no follow-up. Sometimes they're sent to like a, a, a low level mental health area um, where they might be scheduled to see a psychiatrist uh, in a couple of weeks um, because their needs are very low. Um, sometimes they'll be sent to a higher acuity area um, where they may see a psychiatrist the following day or the following business day. Um, and there is typically a psychiatrist embedded in the receiving area, uh, which will um, see patients who are deemed critical for immediate psychiatric care. Um, if that person is not available, they or if the patient is so uncooperative, even before they get to that process, you know, it's sort of like monopoly. You do not pass go, you go directly to jail. And in this case, jail for them would be the acute care infirmary for mental health, where you bypass all of that. You get taken to the psychiatric unit, uh, which would be equivalent to an inpatient unit. 
um, where you are, where then the rest of that process is completed. Um, you might get sedated chemically, you might need to be restrained physically, um, but that's what happens. Um, and then if you're, if you are sent to the acute care unit, um, you are seen daily by a psychiatrist, uh, you get uh, groups, you get, uh, you can get individual therapy, you get art therapy, occupational therapy, music therapy. Um, there's uh, regular um, staffings to go over each patient that's in the unit. Um, a kind of a, a break off of that unit would be like subacute care. Those are people who um, are not sick enough to need to be hospitalized, but cannot kind of maintain uh, in a more uh, unregulated setting. Um, and then we also have sort of a psychiatric nursing home um, for people who um, may be uh, severely demented, have some sort of um, cognitive problem, um, developmental delay in which they would, um, you know, fail to thrive in an in a unstructured environment or be um, preyed upon by other people in those units. Um, so we put them there to protect them from themselves and others. Michael, um, could you comment a little bit, um, I guess, first about the process right from intake about initiating or or otherwise continuing community-based medications for our behavioral health patients? That's the first question. Yeah, so um, this, uh, when I first got to the jail, this was a very difficult task um, because, you know, we don't have the resources to, you know, contact every community provider for patients you're kind of, you were kind of left at the kind of mercy of what the patient was telling you. You know, I, yeah, I, doc, I was getting Xanax three times a day, two milligrams, you know, and if you don't give me my Xanax, I'm going to withdraw and die and it's going to be your fault. So we were kind of held hostage um, by a lot of this um, with all the faults of electronic charting. Um, one of the saving graces has been the ability to have more access to information about patients' care um, outside of the jail um, and in other facilities throughout the city uh, and state. Um, so we can easily access um, what medicines patients most recently picked up, what pharmacy they got it from, what doctor they were being prescribed from. Um, we can see, um, depending on how fast uh, institutions upload information, we can see discharge summaries. Um, so we, we have a whole wealth of information that is now available to us. Um, so that's one part of kind of devising a psychopharmacologic treatment plan for the patients. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and I, I used to say, you know, working at the jail was kind of like, you know, working in a third world country to provide medicine, you know, we, we did not, we do not have access to all the latest and greatest you see uh, advertised on TV, um, you know, never prescribed Latuda in my life or, you know, any of these new medicines, you know, we're Haldol, Thorazine, Prolixin, you know, Prozac, we had a very, we still do have a very limited amount of medicine. So, you know, patients could often be on very complicated regimens out in the community and, you know, we're stuck with, you know, kind of going back old school. Um, in a lot of ways, professionally, I think that was a great experience because a lot of psychiatrists today don't have the kind of, um, they don't have that experience of prescribing those older meds. And those are still extremely good medications um, for specific patients. And so um, I have a lot of colleagues who shy away from tricyclic antidepressants, first generation antipsychotics. Um, a lot of psychiatrists are extremely conservative when it comes to the gold standard of bipolar disorder, which is lithium. Um, you know, all of these were, you know, common practice in that environment. Um, so I feel uh, even though I have left that environment, I am much more prepared in, in you know, what I do today. Thanks. Um, that Actually, that's interesting to hear because I, I too, as a, as a medical doctor, 
um, as opposed to, I'm not that you're not a medical doctor, but as a, as a medicine medical I'm doctor. I'm the fake kind. Yeah, I, that's right. I'm the real, we're the real. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> believe me, I have the, the beyond the highest regard for the interface between behavioral health and, and, and so-called regular medicine. But I too have had a, um, a challenge adjusting to limited formulary. Uh, fortunately for the HIV care, they've given me some, some leeway. But when it comes to general medical practice, you know, we have one from certain classes and other drugs that we just don't have access to, or we have to go through a very elaborate non-formulary process to get access to medicines we're familiar with in the so-called real world and, uh, and, and, and have to learn to do more with less in, in a custody setting. But I, I too find that challenge um, kind of interesting. It's like, wow, I, I hadn't heard of some of these fancy drugs that we're using in the community at all because we don't have access to them. And yet our patients seem to do pretty darn well. Um, I wanted to, to change the subject to another, which is more about like stats in general. We've heard that the Cook County Jail is often considered the largest single site mental health treatment facility in the Midwest, if not the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, you're nodding. So I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about the, the scale of the behavioral health population on the compound. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, at one point we had the Department of Justice involved in our uh, providing of care there. And they actually thought we were under treating um, based on national statistics. That being said, the population density of the Cook County Jail is so high that, you know, on any given day we could be treating one to three, three and a half thousand patients. Um, and, you know, at the, at the, at the dearth of psychiatry available, there was, you know, I think six full-time psychiatrists and, uh, you know, two or three part-time psychiatrists, no nurse practitioners, no APNs, um, no uh, physician assistants. Uh, you know, we were treating 3000 people between the six of us that, you know, it, it can be pretty overwhelming. What, and God forbid one of those providers go on vacation. If you had to give a just a rough estimate, and I realize that it, it, it may flux, but about what percent of the total jail population would you say came in with or is ultimately diagnosed with a primary psychiatric disorder? The Department of Justice would say at least 10%. What would you say? I would say... I would say probably 30%. I knew you were gonna say something higher because that's my, yeah. my impression has been higher. When we think about who, and if you throw in substance use- Substance abuse. Into that milieu, we're probably talking 60, 70, 80, maybe yeah. more, right? I mean, it's, I always, I mean, it's, I hate to say a joke, but I always kind of joke and say it's, you know, 80% of them have a substance use disorder and 20% of them are lying. That's just how it feels sometimes because mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming how much of this we deal with and process on a daily basis. Even in my medical clinic, I'm providing, you know, I'm sprinkling HIV medication on people, but their, their deeper, more challenging issues um, are, in, in, in some cases, the whole reason they end up in custody are linked to, for example, the lack of community-based behavioral health services and our um, failure to prioritize our patients' needs before they end up in custody. I, I often, this is part of my little soapbox, but I often, uh, I've, and I'm posing this to everyone listening on the, on the talk right now, there is no right answer because of course, this is a hypothetical question, but I am posing it to you. Here's the question. Who in our community, whatever community you are in right now, is the most dangerous person? pausing for you to just think about that for a second. And I realize since we don't have time to have everybody chime in with who they, what I hear when I ask this question, when I'm talking to medical students or other groups, things like the person with the gun or the, per, the politician who has a lot of power. I hear all these really interesting viewpoint, of course, how poignant to bring that up today, but that's a whole other politics is not gonna be part of this. And my answer to the hypothetical is always this, it's someone who has nothing to lose. So our society has uh, 
we have basic needs and whether you're a believer in like the Maslow's hierarchy or not, things like food, clothing and shelter, those are not optional. And if you do not have them, you still need them. And if you don't have them, you're either going to suffer and ultimately succumb to, you know, to the elements and die, or you're going to do whatever you need to do to get your needs met. Even if it sometimes leads you into a, um, an illegal activity. So uh, honestly, a great deal of folks who end up in custody have been stripped down to the barest minimums. And we as a collective society have chosen to not meet the needs, even the basic needs of our fellow human beings. <laughs> Sorry, I get a little choked up when I think about this. This is who is in custody. So along with that, I personally think that healthcare is a necessity, it is a need. And when people's needs are not met, things go wrong. And the second part of this is what happens when people are in custody. Our criminal justice system, uh, uh, until recently, things are really starting to change now, which is part of why Dr. Moreno and I are here to talk to you about a, a career in, in mental health and criminal justice system. You can play a very important role in changing what is going on around us. If someone commits a crime or allegedly commits a crime, the way our system works is arrest them, punish, 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 strip them down, and then throw them back out into the community where they're now a stripped down, perhaps even more desperate version of whatever came in there in the first place. And then our community, which does not address their needs, now have created an even more desperate or even more dangerous scenario with someone who has nothing to lose. This is a cycle that has been happening for decades in this country. And the only way it's gonna change is if we and you guys as the future of, of healthcare choose to make a difference in this arena. So the interface between behavioral health and treating behavioral health and mental health issues for folks in custody plays a outsized role in this, this change. Um, I, Michael, you're nodding. So I'm hoping this rings true to why you found it so satisfying to work there. And it's part of why I like working there. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing to add to Dr. Zaywitz's point is, you know, not only is this kind of a, you know, kind of a theoretical sort of cycle that they get put in, um, there's real sort of um, actual things that prevent patients from getting better once they're released from custody. If you're a convicted felon, try getting a job. You, it's like impossible. Or housing. Um, or, or get housing. Or if you're a sex offender, finding a place to live that's, you know, far enough away from a, a, a park or what have you. Um, so these are real, real situations. Um, yeah, you know, so I have um, I have one guy in particular um, who I first met at the jail many years ago, um, floridly manic. Um, you know, he was on Depakote, he was on uh, in uh, I am Thorazine, he was getting Ativan, I am around the clock, Benadryl, um, Po Zyprexa, and he stayed awake for like seven days, and he was extremely difficult to deal with. And he was in his psychotic state. He was extremely racist. There's this big white guy and, you know, um, racial epithets being screened at the other detainees. Um, he, I was the only doctor he trusted. I was the only doctor he trusted. And I still see that guy to this day in my clinic. I haven't been there full time for six years. I'm treating his diabetes. I'm treating his hypertension and I'm treating his mental illness. And every time I see him, I say, you know, look, I think things have probably progressed beyond hydrochlorothiazide in the world of blood pressure management. You really need to see a, a primary care specialist because what I can do for you is limited. Now, every once in a while, I have a family medicine resident who has helped me evolve past hydrochlorothiazide, and he's on lisinopril now, but he won't see anyone else. I am his guy. Even if I fall short in so many ways, 
I'm his guy. And I think that, you know, the continuity and kind of seeing the impact you can have on people. Um, and, you know, he'll come in and he'll say, you know, doc, I'm, I'm keeping on the straight and narrow. I'm, you know, not using cocaine. I don't want to go back there. You really helped me. I want to Did I answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I just, uh, it's a very touching story and it doesn't surprise me. Um, I would want you to be my doctor too. <laughs> um, I have a couch if you want to come and talk. I, uh, do you take, uh, let's see, would you take whatever county has? County care, okay. I take um, cash, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who doesn't take cash? All right. Um, <laughs> so um, I wanted to maybe dive into uh, maybe because I, I love that you brought it up very beginning when you introduced yourself about I'm going to say the voyeuristic side to this because I too find part of what makes my job so interesting every day isn't the medical condition that is presented in the clinic room it's the story behind the person who's in the room you know we're trained to assess people clinically and learn patterns of behavior or patterns of of whatever their health issues are. And that's what we do as diagnosticians and clinicians. We, 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 we apply that. But what happens is, let me give you an example, a really common one is non-compliance or non-adherence to medications. And you know, when someone comes in and they're decompensated condition of whatever, and the first question is, well, are you supposed to be on medication for this? Yes. Well, have you been taking it? No. Why not? And there's whatever the reason, I don't have insurance, I can't afford it. They're, you know what they have a million explain explanations for it and there's no judgment i just want to understand what their barrier to healthcare might be but that being said what i see in charts is you know non-compliant with medication la 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 almost accusatory in and at least it feels that way when i read it but what's very rarely asked at least in medical practice um, and mostly out of time constraints is why as why, you know, why weren't you taking your medicine? Not just that you weren't and that you know you were supposed to. And when you enter the proverbial rabbit hole, that's when you get that, that voyeuristic perspective about the person behind the health problem that's sitting in front of you. And a lot of times it's, uh, it's uh, in fact, it's often a, um, I always think of my inappropriate phrases that I use, like, it's almost like, I, I call it pushing on the emotional fontanelle, you know, and they start crying and then they start to tell you the, you know, the, the, the real issue. They, almost every woman I've ever met in the jail as a patient has been a victim of something horrible. Regardless of what they're in custody for, they are almost universally victimized. They are sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, verbally, emotionally, financially, in every sense of the word, and for great portions of their lives. And you should have no wonder why, for example, they're struggling with whatever, you know, dissociative behavioral disorder, depression, um, let alone the fact that they're in custody for, for having had to do something like sell their body to make money to be able to support uh, their family or, or to feed themselves or to support a drug habit, you know, whatever. But equally as interesting is when I ask the men and, you know, it's, it's not that it's quite as universal, but it, it surprises me how many men will acknowledge things like I too have been sexually abused, things that are, that are often um, stigmatized to an even higher degree if you're a man having experienced these things. The, the stories behind the patients are, are what I find fascinating and really drive um, a, a deeper personal connection with the person that I'm, that I'm in the encounter with. They're, our patients are conditioned that they come in and the doctor just wants to you know, measure their blood pressure, say, here, take these pills and your blood pressure will go down. Goodbye, sir. And very infrequently, do we have the time? Even if you want to ask these questions, it's time. And this is one of my sort of selling points about why I really like working in the jail environment. We do not have, for the most part, because we don't bill, we do not have the same performance metrics that are asked of us in many community-based practices. If you work for managed care, there is an expectation that you will see somebody and the time to see them is from this minute to this minute. 
and you have to get you know, your, your medical or behavioral health issue addressed in that condensed amount of time and the charts are piling up in your door for people in the waiting room. Um, in the jail, the appointment is until I'm done with you. Uh, where are they going? I mean, I mean it respectfully, but where are you going? You know, and a lot of my patients, quite frankly, like to wait because that means they're not in their cell. They're in the waiting room. They're watching Jerry Springer, whatever it is they're doing while they're waiting for Dr. Zaywitz. And I'm not saying anyone wants to wait forever, but if I need to spend an hour with a patient because this one needs that extra whatever, then I'm going to do that. But I also find, and I'm going to wrap it up here, that that extra time and that ability to build that personal connection and that rapport, it, it does require time and it requires an interest in doing so. But I feel like I get better clinical outcomes because of it. Um, they trust me. They get a little. They get a little window. I don't. You know, we're we're not really supposed to get too personal and give them too much of our own insight into our own world for all kinds of reasons and security being one of many. But, but that being said, that, that extra connection has, I, I believe, real world clinical benefits, including the patient's willingness to wanna do the continuity of care like Dr. Moreno gave a, a, a fabulous example of this. When they connect with you and they're leaving custody, well, doc, what do I do when I get out of here? Come see me, come see Dr. Moreno. We'll you know, come see our, our health system, we'll take care of you. And they're gonna be more willing to come when they feel like you are personally invested in them as a person and not just a medical problem. What do you think, Doc? Yeah, you know, uh, the, the one thing I would add is, um, you know, for a lot of these people, this is the only time during their lives that they get healthcare. And under federal law, this is the only group of people in our nation who are required, are demanded to have medical treatment. Constitutionally uh, protected. The 8th mm -hmm. and the 14th Amendments guarantee any citizen in custody a constitutional right to receive community standard of health care. You and me, we have no right to receive health care. We are very privileged if we have access to it, but everyone who's in custody must receive the community standard of care or we are breaking the law. And I don't know about you, uh, Chad, but I've had patients in, in the Department of Corrections who could have easily bonded out, but didn't because of their health problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, and, and, then, and just to say that out loud is, really disturbing that anybody would choose a correctional setting as somehow a better alternative than being free in, in society. But it's not, it's not uh, I wouldn't say it's common, but it's prevalent enough. I have seen it enough. We had a, we had a patient, uh, and again, he also had behavioral health issues, who <laughs> he was smart and he knew the exact dollar amount of what you could steal and not be charged with a felony. Like, so there's like felony theft and then there's like shoplifting. And he knew exactly how much he could steal and not be charged with a felony. And he was an end stage renal patient who needed dialysis. So every time he felt like he needed dialysis, he would just go and steal a loaf of bread from the supermarket and come into the jail and get dialyzed. And they would toss the charges after he got a few sessions of dialysis back out into the community. He'd get sick again, come back in. And, um, and it would be rinse, repeat. And we kept saying, look, sir, you don't need to do this to get dialysis. We'll get you into our dialysis clinic. You don't, you know, we'll get you a medical card. We'll, we'll take care of all this. But because of his um, disorganized thinking, he was, you know, it, it, he just couldn't quite connect those, those dots. And so we were, that's another, that's a, a, a fabulous example of, of a, not that uncommon of a scenario. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So uh, is there anything else that you find, you know, particularly, uh, you know, good or bad? Or how about being fair and balanced, Dr. Marino? Choosing a career inside a correctional setting. What are some of the things that you don't like about it or didn't like about it? Um, the smell. The jail, you know, has a very particular odor. Um, you know, I... Gosh, you know, there really were a lot of things I liked about it. Um, you know, other things I didn't care for. Um, 
you know, kind of the going through airport security anytime you came onto the compound, even if, you know, you had to run out to your car. Um, sometimes the, the, the facility would go on lockdown where no one can leave the facility um, because there's, uh, the example I can think of is um, someone was reviewing the, the scanners as, uh, you know, for the, the metal detector scanners where you put your person stuff through. And upon review, they found someone had a gun. Um, so they had to cut, shut down the whole campus and you couldn't leave even if you were a doctor, nurse, you know, um, until they found said gun. Um, Do you feel there's any safety or security risks no. to you as a provider? No, absolutely not. I am. I was a hundred thousand times more safe at the jail than I am in my office. If someone attacks me in the office, I have to find the panic button. I have to press the panic button, and I have to wait five, six, seven minutes for security to get there by which time I have been bludgeoned to death. Hmm. At the jail, if I was really concerned about safety, I wouldn't even get them out of the cell. All the doors have glass. De well, depending on where you're at, they have glass. I could do the interview through the door. If I brought them out, I could have them fully shackled, you know, shackled behind their back. Um, the security or the, the police officer is there. You know, they're not in the room necessarily. They could be, but they were close enough that if I raised my voice, they were right there and saying, you okay, doc? Do, I, do you need to do anything? Um, I felt extremely safe at the jail. Sorry, you, you segued very nicely into a couple other questions I, that I had about this. Um, they all kind of connected that. One is the interface between preserving medical privacy in a setting where you are, you almost for security reasons have to be observed an officer might be at the door or in the room, especially in behavioral health. I know I've observed the officers are standing right outside the door sometimes, or, or even right at the door. The second is um, the use of technology like telemedicine to deliver behavioral health services to folks in custody. Um, those are two. And then the third is what, what your perception is about um, the training of or the need to train correction staff about behavioral health to deal with an in-custody population. So one is privacy, two is the technology, three is the interface of training and security. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, a couple of thoughts. Um, if we think about HIPAA and HIPAA violations and things like that, there, you know, there's this concept of like, I'm at an elevator talking to someone in a public area and I'm talking about patient information and someone else hears it, that's a violation. If I'm in a clinical care area and I'm talking to a colleague or to a patient and, you know, that's an incidental sort of disclosure, right? So um, that's my first thought about that. The second thought um, is that, you know, we had the fortunate privilege of generally having a, the same group of officers around the clock, day after day. They had special interests in mental health. Many of them had advanced training in mental health care and um, de-escalation techniques and those sorts of things. And they were actually, practically speaking, part of the, the therapeutic team, regardless of whether you wanted them to be or not. You know, you, you had to explain to them, you know, like there was all these stringent rules about like, you know, there's tape on the ground. And if we're in the day room, you as a detainee cannot cross the tape. You know, you can't pass the tape. You got to stay on the other side of the tape. And, you know, they, they would say, okay, time to sit down and watch TV. And there might be one or two guys pacing back and forth and they may pass the tape. And you had to tell the officers like, look, this guy's on an old school antipsychotic part of what he is probably experiencing is something called akathisia, which is the restless sensation of the need to move. And this is how he's dealing with it. That is, that is not a him control sort of issue. That is a mental health 
treatment sequela. So these people, you know, they were in our treatment team meetings, um, not necessarily for the whole time, but they would be participating in part of it. You know, here's what we're observing. They were often great eyes because their primary job was to sit and watch. So they could tell us things like, you know, doc, I, I you know, kind of overheard what that guy said to you while you were with him. I'm gonna tell you right now, he's eaten all his meal. He's intimidating some of the other guys, getting their food, taking their food away from them. You know, and in the room with me, he's like, oh, doc, I'm so depressed. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't do anything. Um, you know, so they often provided valuable information. Um, so that's that. I think um, technology in that environment has um, helped in many ways. You know, um, you know, a lot of these guys, especially in the outer divisions where there was high security, you know, like uh, maximum security people in division nine or division 10, after hours, they would often act up yeah. or engage in self-harm behaviors or say, hey, I took a bunch of pills that I've been saving. And, you know, they would go on a field trip, right? So they would get out of division nine, they would, you know, get a nice mile long stroll to the CERMAC health services, sit for three or four hours in the urgent care waiting area, you know, BS with some of the other detainees that are down there. And some of it could be just for that, you know, just to kind of stretch the legs and get a little variety in the day. Some of it could be a little more um, dubious, you know, like there's, you know, the commute, the amount of time they have to come up with things is massive. And the brilliance of some of their techniques and things that they come up with to do to be able to communicate with someone three divisions over to say, hey, Thursday night, nine o'clock, cut yourself a little bit. I'm going to cut myself in division nine and we're going to meet in the infirmary and we're going to talk about you, uh, you know, mounting, uh, you know, a mob to beat up this other guy who's in a different mm -hmm. gang. Very sophisticated sort of action going on behind the scenes. So there's many reasons why they would do this. Um, the technology has really brought some of that to a halt, not all of it. Sometimes, you know, uh, back to what Dr. Zaywitz was saying about nothing to lose, you know, you call their bluff and they just up the ante, right? They're, they're going to show you one way or another. So, you know, scratching myself a little bit isn't going to do it anymore. You know, if you pick up uh, Google and you uh, Google search the man who ate the jail, you know, they just keep upping the ante. You know, this guy was walking around anything he could find, screws, pens, he would swallow it. And then he'd have to be taken from the jail to the hospital. GI would have to see him. They'd have to scope him or wait for him to pass. Um, so technology has helped with some of that. And then the third question was... You got them all. Well, well, a little bit about okay. the training, but you already covered that. It was that these officers, especially yeah. the ones that work in your units, have additional levels of training. Because you know we, we are a paramilitary compound. When an officer says, get up and go over there, you better get up and go over there. But when you're dealing with someone who's psychotic and has disorganized thought, and you say, get up and go over there, and they don't respond, the, the regular officers might perceive that as defiant behavior and use, use force. But the, the folks who are um, trained to work in your units have that, that uh, additional layer of training and understanding and, and I like the, the term de-escalation because that's, that's probably one of the most number one, most important things they do when there's an escalation um, is to be able to, to bring that back down before someone has to get pepper sprayed or something, something worse than that. Um, I don't know if you know anybody like this, but certainly in my department, you know, um, psychiatrists have personalities, all doctors do. Um, one of the things that I find that is difficult for a lot of physicians because we are kind of you know, leaders in our field. And when we're at the hospital, we're kind of leader uh, of, of the hospital. We're leaders in that respect. Um, you know, at the jail, we're guests of the Department of Corrections, right? Okay. So this is not our ship. We are not in charge. We have very specific roles. And in that specific role, we have rights and obligations to 
demand certain things, right? But if the officer says, doc, you got to get out of the room right now. You got to end the interview. We need you out. That's, you got to stop. You got to stop. You got to get out of the room. You got to do what they say. That's hard pill for some doctors to swallow. And there's a little bit of, uh, what's the old term, a pissing contest. Um, uh, you don't want to get in that contest. You want to show the officers respect, the correctional staff respect, um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones protecting you. And they're going to remember, which is horrible to think about, but they will. And they are, you know, despite the um, stereotypes that may be attached, uh, my, my main experience with correction staff is that these are professionals who are there to do a job and to maintain a secure environment so that we can practice medicine safely, among other things. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't look at them as anything other than, like you said, a part of the team. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, this would be a good opportunity maybe to open it up if there are any questions. Um, I see, yeah, so I see there's a, a text box question. Um, let me, uh, I'll, I'll read it, Dr. Moreno, unless you can pull up the text box. It says, before we run out of time, Dr. Moreno, why are the medication choices so limited in this correction setting? And as a follow-up, are there other limitations like lack of ancillary staff, nurses, MAs in a correctional setting? Thank yeah, you. Travis. Great questions. Yeah, great questions. Um, uh, part of it comes down to the almighty dollar, you know, that the, they are getting free health care as demanded by the constitution and it is expensive. Um, to house, you know, the last statistic I heard, to house and provide some, you know, we're not talking about complex medical care. We're talking about standard medical care with people who have health needs um, is about $60,000 a year at last statistic I heard, which was probably about five years ago, um, to detain that person for one year with, you know, a mild to moderate level of medical need. Um, you know, schizophrenia in general has a huge financial toll in the American health system um, overall. Um, Haldol, Thorazine, Prolixin, those are pennies a piece. Um, Invega, which is a newer drug, um, if you want to get an injection of Invega, it's about $1,400 a month. Um, so a lot of it comes down to cost. The other thing, and I don't know that uh, Chad has to deal with this quite as much as we do in psychiatry, um, uh, but our medicines can be easily abused and misused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Seroquel, Quetiapine for the, you know, I forget we're talking to medical students and brand names are something y'all don't know. Um, quetiapine. Um, is a highly, highly abused substance. And it's an antipsychotic, it's a newer antipsychotic, and you think, well, who's getting high off of that? Um, in the community, on the streets, it has street value. You know, it's called baby heroin, Susie Q's. Um, a lot of people like to mix it with um, cocaine in an effort to try to counterbalance some of the bad side effects of cocaine. Um, I believe when you mix it with cocaine and heroin, it's called speedballing, if I remember correctly. Um, it kind of gives you that same effect. So Seroquel is like a medicine we had to get rid of, right? You, you, no one's getting Seroquel in the jail anymore um, because it was abused. Um, venlafaxine, um, they were snort, chopping it up and snorting it. Um, they were called pink panties because the tablet is pink. Um, and it would cause a lot of problems with uh, hypertensive urgency um, because they were snorting and it was kind of getting to the bloodstream really fast. Um, so there's a lot of these drugs um, that uh, are misused um, to make hooch. They'll barter, uh, you know, benzodiazepines if you're doing a taper as they come into the jail. Um, they'll, you know, put it in the toilet with some, you know, peeled fruit, uh, you know, and make wine. Um, Thanks, but no thanks. Um, so that's the, did I answer both questions? I'm sorry. I think so. You, you know, There's a couple more questions, Dr. Marino, in the little bit of time we have left. So let me read them to you. The first one, uh, it says, I've just finished reading 
Waiting for an Echo by Dr. Montrose that spoke to the social injustice some of the prisoners experience, I was curious if the concept of nature-based therapy has been explored at the jail. I know about trauma-informed care, but I admit I don't know what nature-based therapy is. Okay. Yo no say. Well, we'll have to look that one up. Um, so I'm sorry for not being able to answer that one. The next question, again, these are all for you, Dr. Marino, because you're our hero. Um, you mentioned that when you worked in the Department of Corrections, there were six patients to every 3,000. Um, what would you say provides the biggest barrier to providing more psychiatrists to the Department of Corrections? Is it funding? Is that the biggest factor? Well, I, I think funding is part of it. Um, Six psychiatrists, I'm sorry, for, for 3,000 inmates, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think that, um, look, I don't know many medical students or residents that are ending their you know, professional educational training who say, man, I can't wait to go work in a jail. Um, so there's a supply and demand issue. The demand is very high. The supply is extremely low. Um, psychiatrists over the years, as it becomes um, uh, more and more recognized as a major health problem in this country, and it becomes a little, little less stigmatized, um, the need for psychiatrists in general has escalated. Um, salary and reimbursement has gone up. Uh, well, not, I shouldn't say reimbursement, but salary, if you're a salaried physician, the, 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 the amount to fill a position in psychiatry has gone up. Um, all those things make it very difficult for the Department of Corrections or the health system to recruit doctors into those slots. So I, I think that's, I'm so glad you, that was a great question to segue to. I'm going to use this as my closing comments. Um, there may be more questions, but this is my sort of closing call to action. Um, I'm grateful and, and truly honored to, and I'm sure Dr. Moreno will echo this, to have been invited to have an opportunity to share a little bit of what our career paths were like inside the correction system. Um, what Dr. Moreno basically said right there is, we need you. And there aren't a line of people asking for these jobs. There are sometimes vacancies that go unfilled. So if you find some portions of what we talked about to pique your interest or this, this motivates you or drives you to choose or at least consider a career in correctional health care, um, I would like to parlay that by offering my contact information, Marissa or whoever else on the line I am, I am welcoming you to share my email address to anyone who requests it. Um, Dr. Moreno, I, I hope you feel the same way about yourself, but we, um, we welcome your, uh, your queries about what, a little bit more about what it's like, or quite frankly, how, uh, <laughs> how to apply if that comes, you know, comes to, to the fruition for you. Um, Michael, and that's my parting thought. So thank you for your attention, Dr. Moreno. Oh, and there's one more question, Dr. Moreno, real quick, real quick. What do you see as the role of prison physicians in prison reform? Um, you know, I, 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 I am not a um, legislature person. Um, so, you know, the big kind of societal question to that, I don't know that I have a great answer to. But I think, you know, um, if we think about the different fields in psychiatry, one of them is consult liaison. Um, the liaison part of that, I think, is extremely important and applicable to mental health in the correctional setting, which is education, which is bridging the gap between the patient detainee and the correctional environment and helping them kind of on a micro level gain a little bit more knowledge and understanding every day. Um, you know, the guys are uh, the, the officers, they were great. Um, they were very open. They were very excited to be part of the team. Um, you know, and I think that that has a positive trickle down effect um, in the day to day of the correctional environment on a micro level. 
Um, on a macro level, uh, let me take that one. That's right. above my pay grade. Yeah, I would say that, that everybody here, whether you work in corrections or, or, or not, you all play a role in prison reform if you choose to. I feel like part of my role is what we're doing right here, which is to educate you about what's, what's broken I don't necessarily know how to fix it. These are huge problems. They're very complicated, but it starts with legislature and our lawmakers. So if you wanna see things change, you have to advocate at a grassroots level. This is letter writing, phone calls, doing presentations. And you said education, Dr. Marino, educating people who are less informed about what's really happening in custody setting. And when people, when, when they get a good and unbiased perspective on this, much of the stigma and the stereotypes are, are erased, or at least people think a little harder about it. So um, that's my, my final comment about advocacy and pr prison reform. You know, we can't, we can't let them go to prevent COVID. Only the courts can do that. Every day, and I mean this again, poor choice of words, last, I know we're probably at our time limit here, the drum circle is outside the jail every day going, let them go, let them go, let them go. You are wasting your time with the drum circle. The sheriff cannot let them go. The courts can let them go. You should be going to the judges and pleading with the public defenders and the judges to work this out. We want them out as much as anybody else does. We don't want COVID, we don't want whatever. So with that, I also threw in the text box a book. I would recommend that some people consider reading anything else, Marissa, before we thank everybody for their time? No, I think this was great. I'm sure, you know, sorry for the people who have more questions, but they've both generously offered to give their contact information. So it's in the program I sent out. If you don't have that or you need another copy, just shoot me an email and I can get you in touch with them. And also highly recommend the new Jim Crow book. But yeah, thank you both so much for being here. This was a really enlightening um, topic that we really don't hear enough about. At your service at any time. Yeah, definitely. Think about correctional health care. It is awesome.